All right, off we go. All right, thanks for hanging in there. Uh, for the last talk in this room, I know some of you have been sitting and listening to people jabber at you for like four or five days, so I appreciate you hanging around. Um, I'm Mandy Walls. I, if you, I look familiar to you. I used to work at Chef, so I've been here a few times in the past. I now work at PagerDuty, um, which is interesting, because like, if you listen to Adam's talk yesterday, Chef, very sweary company, pager duty, similar like age of company, but like founded by Canadians. So totally not sweary. So yeah, right? What the hell? So very different. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I'm a DevOps advocate, which means I'm obligated to like blabber at you for a little bit before I show you gratuitous YAML code. So be patient, we'll get there. If you want to get in touch with me, I'm LNXCHK pretty much everywhere. Never a battle for that handle. I tweet and I toot and all that stuff, so you can find me wherever. And if you work on anything that happens to integrate with PagerDuty and you want to come hang out with me on Twitch, send me an email. I'd love to have you on our channel and talk about whatever it is that you do. So I'm going to talk about automation. Who automates? Who likes automation? Yeah, of course you do, right? That's why we're fucking here, is, is automation. And because we work with lots of different companies doing lots of different things for lots of different types of organizations, there's lots of different things that folks want to automate, try to automate, don't really get too far with the automation. And this conference in particular, we're approaching it from infrastructure as code and config management, and that's a kind of automation that we're all super stoked about. It's super helpful, helps us get all of our shit together when we're you know, putting things out on the cloud or wherever they have to live. But there's lots of other kinds of automation. And we've heard some folks talk about you know, trouble you run into. Even if you have good config management, you might have interesting things happening when your QA department wants their own environments and things like that totally happen. So we're going to talk a little bit about what makes good automation, ignoring Adam's new breaking rules and all that kind of stuff for right now and uh, a little bit about some platforms that can help you tackle the 200 or n hundred percent problem where everybody needs to know a million things about a million different programs, right? Because there's, there's so much of that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the potentials for self-service automation in large environments where you have a lot of different programs, different platforms, different things that people need to know or need to interact with and why that becomes kind of a, a struggle and what you can do about it. So we're gonna start there. Automation, right? We're just gonna ask machines to do the things that are boring, that we don't wanna do anymore, that are maybe a little bit complex, that you know, who has been in a terminal window and typed something into the wrong machine? Who has you know, copied something out of the wiki and it, it ran off into the sunset and you miss the last four arguments, right? Have been there and done that. We want to avoid all those kinds of programs or problems when we are dealing with our production software. I've totally done all of those things. So we look at the benefits of automation. We know kind of in our minds it just it feels better, right? But when we're looking to sort of encapsulate what we're getting out of this, right, we are managing all these complex systems and workflows. We hear a lot about, you know, microservices architectures and all that sort of gobbledygook that, that folks love with distributed systems now, but that increases complexity. It means you have to know more about what's going on and who else you're talking to and who manages that other thing that you're dependent upon and like, are they actually doing a good enough job for you to use their thing or not? And like, there's all these other complex problems that come up with it. We also want to be able to cope with change, not just what we're changing and our applications that are being changed, but also all the things in our substrate that change, whether it's something crazy bananas like the log4j or it just happens to be regular updates that come in from our vendors. All those things create lots of complexity. Still seeing questions in places like Hangops on how do you patch systems you know, on a regular basis. Like There's still folks out there you know, struggling with those kinds of updates. We also want to reduce all those mistakes, all the copy pasta that happens, and we want to reduce toil. Toil is just a fancy SRE word for the boring shit we don't want to do anymore, right? It's stuff that 
they, the technical definition they use is it scales linearly as your environment gets larger. But it's the basic stuff, it's hygiene, right? It's like doing your updates and making sure your backups work and doing all those things that you need to do. It's like brushing your teeth. If you don't do it one day, you can kind of get away with that, right? It's okay. You don't do it for months, like people are gonna be worried about you, right? So that's kind of where we're headed with things like toil. If we ignore it too long, it's gonna be a problem. So we want to outsource it to our automation. There's some potential drawbacks to all of this, right? Is it possible to automate too much, right? Some of this stuff does come up, right? In systems engineering uh, research, right? Looking at things like the loss of expertise. There's papers on this. I have some references for you at the end. There's some really good ones there to read about. People have been thinking about this stuff since like the late 1960s, especially in the realms of like nuclear power generation, aerospace, those kinds of places where you want to do the automation to protect yourself, but at the same time, you bring a junior onto your team and they're like, hey man, everything's solved. I don't have to know any of this stuff, right? So somebody has to be trained up to learn to manage the automation, to learn to automate new stuff, to learn to update the automation as things grow and become more complex. You also can encounter brittleness, where automation is sort of linked heavily or too tightly coupled with the objects as they currently exist, and trying to break out of that and build for the next generation is super hard. You get to the point where those switching costs are just too much, and you're ready to abandon everything that you wrote in that particular version of that platform and start somewhere new. It certainly happens. And the last one is detachment from work, which is one of those things becomes one of those dark management memes, right? And has become part of the conversation around, hey man, Twitter's still running even though he fired all these SREs, so obviously we don't need SREs, right? We don't need folks to manage all these systems because the automation is so good and why do we need all you folks around here anyway? So the pointy haired boss pops up and says, eh, we don't need you because you automated everything. And that doesn't work on the long term. Eventually everything is going to come crashing down. So looking at how we approach automation from a software development perspective, I don't care if it's your config management platform or if like other crap that you run, like everybody's got their little scripts, like do this.sh and don't do that.bak or whatever it is. And we look for the same things in our automation software that we want out of the application software. We want to know that it's going to do the thing that it says on the tin, right? So hopefully it's a little bit testable, at least. Who's ever used bats? Here's a, 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 a classic. I love bats, right? So bats was at least testing platform for bash, right? Like why, but also yes, please, right? So super cool. You also want things to be flexible. They should move as your architecture moves. They should be able to improve as your architecture improves. The next two, reviewable, put under version control so that I know things are moving forward. I've got folks who can look at this thing and say, am I crazy? Is this actually going to work? Make sure that we're not going off into you know, some kind of side quest here with the automation that's going banana crackers on its own and not focusing on what we need to do. We want to be applicable to related resources and not a one-off. I've definitely been into customer environments where like two teams sitting in the same row of cubicles have two completely different non-compatible versions of Tomcat that they're running. And like, that's a bad idea from the start. You definitely don't want to go down that road with automation. And we also want it to be repeatable and audible. I want to know who ran this thing, right? Something goes wrong. Who ran it? Who touched that? Where'd it come from? That's hard to do if everybody's just logging into a jump box and sudoing and firing something off. So I pulled these from a book called Architecting for Scale by Lee Atchison. There's some really good bits and pieces in this book if you haven't looked at it. Um, there's another one, uh, another part of the chapter, he points out like uh, service ownership, which is also super interesting for, for large organizations. We also then want to think about as we are working in our day-to-day, -day, what we can capture, what we can build automation for, that we save ourselves from ourselves in some ways, right? Coming from pager duty, we kind of talk about this in like an incident response sort of context, but applies if I want to 
build a QA environment. Does QA already have eight environments? Do they really need another one, or is it okay? But there's encapsulated expertise that might be siloed off. It might be partitioned from the rest of the organization. Folks who know all the stuff about the things get requests all the time for knowledge about the things. That's interruptions. It takes them away from their regular jobs, it takes them away from the things that they're doing to improve stuff to be able to say, oh yeah, you know, we just ran the query, you guys have eight environments, you really need to turn one off before you build another one, that's why you got that error, you know? Or if I'm dealing with a, an incident or something on my application, and I need to get information from the architecture somewhere, in the, whether it's Kubernetes or it's running in containers or wherever else it is, or I need to debug the database or some other connection. I'm like querying other people constantly, moving things around, trying to pick up the information that I need. That takes a lot of time. It takes a drag on the, creates a drag on the requester who's like poking around, who knows this thing that I need to know, and it creates a drag on the people who are responding because they were doing something else. They have other work to do. And like answering your questions maybe not the most valuable thing they should be doing. So we talk about what we should automate, where do we come from in the automation? And like for every tech topic, there's an XKCD, right? So of course there's this one, which is really a breakdown of time saved, right? How much time do I save by taking this particular horrible task that I have to do and it takes me this amount of time, I have to run it this many times during a, a five year period, say, or even a month, right? And if I automate it, how much time do I get back, right? So when folks are looking for KPIs or ROIs or any other three, level, three letter acronym for getting benefit out of stuff, right? We can break it down. I have this task, it takes this long to run, people ask me to do it 20 times a week, here's the time I would save by automating it, right? Happens in all kinds of uh, workflows. And then we think about, well, if, even if I automate it, you are still requesting it from me, but what if I gave it to you? So you ran it yourself, right? So then we have to address what gets in the way of that. We've talked a little bit about this in other talks here this week. Like, Adam calls this the 200% problem, like an n-hundredth percent problem. When you think about everything else that's in your environment, folks don't necessarily know exactly what they need. Give QA an environment. What does that mean? How many hosts is that? How much network security is it? What does it plug into? What do they need to have access to? All of that stuff. Even if they know that, do they know enough about the platform to be able to make that request themselves using an API? even using the web UI. Maybe not, right? And then the last one, you have this access gap. Whether you're in a regulated environment or not, not everybody has access to all the environments, right? Because they shouldn't. So we want to address all three of those things. So we can link up all the knowledge that's sort of suspended and siloed off on the left-hand side and hook it up with all the cool shit we've already written on the right hand side, so that all these folks can make use of everything that everybody knows in a safe way and make it more predictable for everybody who needs the stuff. Because it's not that these folks aren't smart enough to know all the stuff, it's just that there's too much stuff to know for all of these environments. So we think about designing self-service automation, and this is hard, like your ops team, your DevOps team, your platform engineering team, probably doesn't have their own product manager, right? You're not answerable to someone who's gonna tell you to remember your personas, right? And think about you know, what folks know and, and what, how they're gonna interact with things. So we wanna think about it for ourselves, right? The team that we're gonna share things with, but also the folks that we want to hopefully sort of level up and give them access to things. So thinking about how our users work, provide results to them that make sense is it just okay to say okay, or do they want more output than that, right? Do they need something else? We want a consistency of experience. If there's a green button for them to choose on one thing, there should be a green button on all the things. And give them documentation in context. It's just software design, it's just tool design, right? But like if you're used to writing shell scripts or Go scripts or whatever else, it can be a little bit tough 
to sit down and think about all that stuff. That's totally fine. But we're going to talk about encapsulating it a little bit better. And some folks are like hostile to this, right? Um, I had a coworker in one of my early jobs who was very proud of being a, an SAFH, a systems administrator from hell, to the point where like that was his login on Kerberos, so we'll date it that far back. And he decided that all of our tools should be written in, I forget if it was TC shell or K shell, but whatever it was, our distro had already dropped it. So the first thing you had to do was install this thing that he was writing all of his tools in because he was the senior. And you're like, man, that's just hostile. Like, what's your problem? Like, we live in Linux now, not SunOS 4 or whatever it was. So get with the bash, right? So thinking about everyone else on our team and everyone else that we want to have use things. We're going to turn expertise into automation. I'm going to encapsulate all this amazing stuff that you already know and give it to folks who need it but don't need to know it, right? You're the mechanic and you help you know, maintain the car. They're going to drive it, right? They're going to drive it safely. They're going to drive it in the road the way they're supposed to, but they're going to drive it, right? So we're going to make the automation safe to give to these other folks because all they know is what they want the outcome to be. They don't need to know all the gory details underneath, right? Not to the point where we're going to you know, change the cloud out underneath them. The earlier talk was pretty awesome in that journey, but um, just get to the point where if I push a button, I can do the thing. So we take a look at like, the kinds of tasks that we can safely give to people, and organizationally, this can be interesting, right? Some folks have sort of the mental picture of automation of like the brooms in Fantasia, right? So Mickey doesn't want to mop the floor and he animates the mop and it goes bananas and there's lots of mops and bad things happen. And we're not headed that direction, hopefully, with our automation. But we can sit down and think about sort of the low hanging fruit, right? The things in the green part of the circle that don't change anything on the system, but just provide context, right? And so it should have like a low impact. Things like checking the performance of the system or information gathering, maybe fetching some logs depending on where they are. Really easy things that folks will hopefully be comfortable with, but in a completely non-automated environment, someone is like requesting those or asking someone else for them if they don't know where they are. And then we can get more complex, things like restarts, maybe multi-step restarts, other diagnostics that might poke at things in an interesting way where we might need to like copy uh, part of the runtime into like an S3 bucket or other interesting things like that and maybe eventually get comfortable enough to get, step into that red zone a little bit. Like, can we automate our firewall changes? I've worked places where we've been good enough to do that, right? Maybe we can automate multi-service rolling restarts, right? Hopefully folks can handle some of that right now. Or lots of places are already in an environment where you can add or remove capacity. It's already part of the platform. But if it's not, looking at that. So there's plenty of things to sort of break down for how you approach going into the automation. Are we looking for time savings? We can look at that chart. Are we looking for tasks and specific components there that, that we can do? And we can break them down in both ways. And then we can think about how far they're going to go. The little bit of demo I'm going to show you is uh, kind of buried in the, on the left-hand side of this, but there's plenty of opportunities for other things that move on to, to the right. So automation opportunities, just a fancy way of saying we don't have automation yet, right? We haven't automated any of this stuff that we could, and folks are still like asking us for junk all the time. We look at human-initiated automation, sort of the self-service part of this. Humans run it, and they wait for the output and that's what they're after, it's something specific that the humans want. If we have automation with oversight, humans can watch the automation, maybe it's going on in the background and they can see some telemetry on it. We're looking at sort of automation with fallback, that next step. Humans are just notified if the automation fails. They're like, hey man, we tried restarting this thing and it still didn't work, so we're gonna like alert you and let you know. And the last one is that your automation just turns into metrics. Instead of like Alice and Bob restarting a service 40 times in a week, you get a metric on a chart somewhere that says, hey man, this automation restarted this service 40 times this week. Last week it was only 35, so like somebody should look at this, right? And you start to get more information that way out of what's going on and just creates data. 
most of the stuff we have kind of never gets to the last part, doesn't really need to. If we have so many things that folks are requesting on an ad hoc basis, that's where we're gonna save ourselves the most time. So I wanna talk a little bit about Rundeck open source. Who's heard of Rundeck? I think there was a talk here like six years ago from someone about Rundeck. Um, if you don't know, PagerDuty bought Rundeck a couple of years ago. Um, I'm gonna talk about the open source version of Rundeck, you can download it now if you want to. Um, it is Java-based, self-hosted, so open source, but like open source Java is kind of an interesting whole community that way, but um, it's runbook automation. So it takes all those scripts that you have in your wiki, all those little command lines, things that you're copying and pasting around, and gives you a place to like store them forever so that folks can run them when they want to. It's self-hosted, this version. You can run it on Linux or Windows, if that's really your style. The configuration is in YAML, right? So uh, that's super fun. And we're gonna look at actually developing your own plugin, like what's actually required there. And um, there's lots of plugins to be downloaded. And actually one of the most popular plugins for Rundeck is using it as a um, Ansible control server so that you're um, allowing folks to execute Ansible playbooks on an ad hoc basis based on what they're allowed to do in the Rundeck server. So plenty of folks using it for that. So let's see if this will work, right? I've been signed out, so that's exciting. All right, so this is a Rundeck UI. It's organized into projects. So that's the, sort of the top line of where I can start to partition people off into what they're allowed to see and like manage how they're able to engage with the, the components that are in the server, right? So top level project can be development environments or things for the database team or whatever. This is a, an open source tutorial project we have called the Welcome Project. So it has a bunch of like examples and tools and fun stuff in it for folks to experiment with. There's a couple of different ways you can like actually get work done from here. The most basic thing is a command and we can just figure out if there's nodes in here. Maybe not. If there isn't, that's fine. They're not, okay, no worries. Run it on the local. So I have the local server. It knows about itself and I can run things there. The other part that I have here then is jobs. And this is where we really get to the point where I can say, hey man, here's your set of jobs for your team. Go crazy. You know, here's your diagnostics package. Here's your new environments. Here's your setting up things even via Terraform or whatever it is so that each team can manage all of their own stuff and they're not constantly asking you, hey, can you do X, Y, or Z for me? So I have a couple in here that are just basic things. And we click the green button, right? Who loves the green button? It just does the thing. It comes back and says everything was okay, right? So it doesn't matter who I give this to. Green okay, it's green, it's okay, it's all good, right? So folks can understand what, what's going on. And I can drill down into it and get more detail out of what was going on, but if I don't need that, I don't need that. If someone tells me, hey, your instructions are, go to the Rundeck server, run this job, I ran the job, it was green, everything's great. The fun part then is that when I come back into the main part of the project, I have an audit log, right? So I'm not kind of stuck running weird things on a jump host somewhere. I've got a record of who did the thing at what time and what happened. So that if someone comes in and says, hey, who ran the thing? I can say, hey, admin ran the thing, right? And, and we can go from there. So let's see if we can get my plugin to run. It worked earlier, but who knows? So one of the cool things about the whole uh, project is we can add our own jobs super, super easily. So we'll see how this goes. So I have a little plugin that I wrote called Hello Bash, because why wouldn't it? 
and we're going to find it down here. So this is my plugin. It's pretty simple. It wants some user input. I'm going to save that. We're going to check the nodes. We're going to execute it locally because I don't have any nodes to dispatch to. And then I'm going to create this job. If I run it now, it goes and it runs, right? It took some input from me, went out and ran a command on the host. If I was dispatching it to remote nodes, it would also do that as well. It needs, just needs to know if, if they're Unix or Windows, because it has to be able to log into them. So the usual business there that we're looking at. Now, if I have another team that also wants to use this plugin, but they have different input for it, I just create another job specifically for that team. So we get a new job. We say hello for team two. Come on. I love computers. Hello. Okay. Here we go. All right. Let's see if it took. There we go. So I have the same plugin, the same kind of job. It takes a different set of input, but I can give it to a whole other team. Right? So I can reuse my automation, I can give it to other folks, whoever's requesting these things, they can have their own special versions of these so that we've abstracted all of that work away. And again, back to like the dashboard, I get my executions and everything's great. Well, the interesting part comes in with like, I don't want everybody and their brother to have access to all this stuff. So we can lock things down and there's a bunch of ACLs. They're in YAML, so you're fine. It's not crazy business. And if I have my friend Alice here, she's going to log in, but she doesn't have permissions to a whole lot of stuff. So Alice logs in. She has the welcome project, but she's got like nothing, right? We have totally locked her out of all these tasks so that I can delegate to the people who need to be delegated to very specifically. Specific nodes, specific jobs, specific pieces of the server, all that stuff so that when Alice logs in, she gets her view. When Bob logs in, he gets his view. And they're locked down to the environments that they're allowed to see. Right? So that if they're on two different teams, they obviously have different tasks that they want to be able to do. Even if they're on the same team, maybe they have different responsibilities. And you want to maintain that. So totally possible to lock things down to the point where like, you just don't even know what's there because it's none of your business. Right? It's not your stuff. So super helpful there. The plugins, there's lots of plugins. We're going to look at the installed plugins. Stuff that comes with it, right? The basic things. Open SSH, Ansible stuff. Here's my plugin, right? The one that I wrote. It shows up just like everything else. So if you have a bunch of work that you need to get done internally for your teams, you just add the plugins for the work that you need to get done. You can manage them like everything else. So it's super helpful from that perspective as well, because like, even though there's several hundred plugins across the ecosystem, like, you don't know what you're doing out there. You could be doing anything, right? And there's always new stuff popping up. So if you've already got a, a script or you've already got a little program or you've already got an API call that you know is going to do the thing that you want, you just abstract it, encapsulate that expertise so that when your teams log in, they hit the green button, and the magic happens. So it's all good. So. I'm going to have to log back in on my slides. Even though they're supposed to be available offline, it's fine. It's just, yeah. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, it's me. Are you sure? I guess. Some days, I just don't even know anymore. You know? They, it's good they call that speed bump, because it really just feels like a smack in the head. That's my parking lot. I don't need that. 
Okay, so I'll wrap up here. You were supposed to be available offline. Come on. This is kind of my last slide anyway, so we'll talk through it. This is a configuration for the actual plugin that we put together, right? So this is my Hello Bash plugin. This is one file I've broken up so we can kind of talk through the pieces that are needed, right? All the stuff that's here. The left side, just metadata. Looks super familiar if you've written metadata for anything else, right? Who owns this thing? What's its name? What version is it, right? It's metadata. On the right hand side, we have the work it does and what it needs to do that work, right? So it's a provider there. That whole thing is one sort of workflow component. It has a name and a title. That's what's going to show up in my plugins list. What kind of service it provides. And there's a whole list of these. And this is just remote execute, which is fine. There's a other like workflow and, and other bits and pieces there. It's a script. I tell it what the interpreter is, because I don't care, right? You guys can run whatever you want to, wherever you want to. If you want to run all your stuff in TC shell, you're going to install it everywhere. Like, go crazy, right? This one happens to be in Bash. We just tell it where to find it. It has a script file that travels along in it, in the package. And if there's any arguments, if there's any input that I want to give it, whether it's like the team name or an environment name or a date of expiration of the thing, whatever it is, I can pass those in as arguments there. And then the bottom part is just how the UI gets laid out. So like this is a simple string input showed up on the UI just to give people a place to say, hey, what's this going to be? So super basic from that component, right, just to get started. But like lots of folks we encounter have plenty of bash scripts that are out there that do work for them and you want to be able to give them to somebody else to hit the button and make the magic happen. We would love to have you as part of the Rundeck community. Uh, if you've used Rundeck in the past and you want to take a look at it again, love to hear from you. Um, there's like, a, we, this was, version is the open source version, so anyone can download it and give it a whirl. It runs and then uh, there's an example program, it's an example project that actually runs in Docker. So if you're using Docker, or using Docker on the desktop, um, you can actually just download that whole project, fire the thing up, and get a fully functioning run deck environment so that you can use that to uh, fiddle around with, do your own plugin development right there in that environment, it's fully featured from that perspective. The enterprise version has like some GUIs, but like that hides the YAML, who wants to do that, right? So super fun there. Um, if you engage with PagerDuty at all, you wanna give that a whirl, uh, we're at pagerduty.com. Uh, Rundeck itself lives at rundeck.com. And then I've got a whole bunch of resources for folks who are interested at this link, that's also where the, the uh, QR code goes. There's a tutorial for Rundeck in general. There's a tutorial to build the actual plugins with one of our um, sales engineers who does a, an excellent job of walking through that and what's required. Um, so like you zip it into a file and like all these great things. So um, that's also there as a video. And the Rundeck community hangs out on uh, Google Groups and also in the PagerDuty forums, which is just community.pagerduty.com. So we would love to hear from you uh, if anyone is out there running automation stuff and has things that they want to take a look at. We'd also love to hear from you if you are using PagerDuty and want to come hang out with us on our Twitch stream or come on our podcast or write on our blog or I work in DevRel. Like, it's all content. Like, give me all your content. I would love to hear from you. So it's all great. Um, so yeah, I can take some questions. We're kind of early enough. So that's the end of the day, right? So thanks for sticking out with us. <laughs>